Um, thanks everyone for joining us um, with our, for our site's community call today. The program team is committed to creating a space for our community of dedicated practitioners to come together safely. Um, beginning with our meeting today, we'll be holding these community conversations periodically and more information to follow shortly in Danielle's presentation. Um, a few quick reminders before we kick off. We are recording the session. Thank you, Paul. Um, we'll be sending it out to all attendees afterwards. And for the agenda today, our site's program lead, Danielle Piranandi, will present updates on the program, share project highlights, and some new efforts that are underway. Um, following her presentation, our credentialing specialist, Shauna Coulter, will share a refresher on the site's CEU process um, and course reviews. We encourage you to send presentations, excuse me, to send you questions or comments um, in either the chat box or the Q&A section. Feel free to use these functions throughout the presentation. We'll try to get to all of them at the end in the Q&A section. Okay, so the session is approved for one site's CEU with GBCI. We'll include the course ID for your convenience after the, um, the presentation and our follow-up. So Danielle, if um, you're ready to go, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, can you hear me okay? Great, thanks, we hear you. Okay, thanks, Anna Gray. Hello, everyone, and happy Earth Day. As you are most likely aware, today marks the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. We intentionally picked this day for our first sites community call because sites of 2020, because sites was developed to protect, restore, and elevate the value of landscapes as they are critical living systems we need in our communities. We believe every day should be Earth Day. So thank you again for joining us. We have a really great turnout and looking forward to sharing uh, this information and hearing from you. First, we'd like to hear from you. So anytime during this webinar, please let us know why is sites valuable to you. You can send this uh, via the chat box or the Q&A. As noted, um, this is the first Sites Community Call of 2020. This will be an ongoing series of webinars to connect with the Sites community and share knowledge and experience. These were also designed to offer free site CEUs as we greatly value this community. For our future webinars, we plan to invite guest speakers who may include team members from certified projects so they can share insight into their process, any, any lessons learned, and uh, subject matter experts who inform the development of sites credits and among others. We have ideas for these, but we want to hear what you would like to learn about on future community calls. So during this webinar via the chat box or Q&A, feel free to share these ideas or you can do so after the webinar as well um, to sites at gbci.org. So let's get started. Sites is driving sustainability efforts beyond the building. As many of us on this call know, in order to be truly sustainable, resilient, healthy, and equitable, we must design and weave meaningful and sustainable outdoor spaces into our built environment. So rather than be an afterthought, Sites ensures that the site, the surrounding community and local ecology informs the design process early on and is kept through the project completion and into site, site management. Since its inception, the site's rating system was developed with rigor and flexibility in mind, applying to a wide variety of project types, sizes, and locations, as you can see from these images of some of the site certified projects. Early on, the site's team embraced ecosystem services as the foundation for the site's guidelines and metrics. These services include, but are not limited to filtering air pollutants, controlling erosion, maintaining drinkable water, regulating climate, and improving human health and wellness. Ultimately, each credit in the site's rating system considered how it would protect and enhance ecosystem services on a development project. Sites believe that any project, whether the site of a corporate campus, city park, or academic institution, has the potential to conserve, restore, and create these ecosystem services. The site's B2 rating system and accompanying reference guide represents the culmination of over eight years of research and field testing. Sites fills an important gap in the marketplace in properly addressing the space outside of and between buildings, yet also for projects with no buildings at all, because while every building has a site, not every site has a building. This rating system provides a set of guidelines and performance metrics for creating and evaluating sustainable and resilient landscapes. 
The system follows the typical design and development process covering various aspects such as ecological restoration, green infrastructure, material selection, strategies to improve human health and well-being. It places a lot of attention to the pre-design stage, sec section two and one, and evaluates actual construction practices. It asks projects also to plan ahead for sustainable site maintenance, thinking about this early on in the design process, as well as incentivizing performance monitoring. In terms of eligibility, this is again um, geared toward new construction and major renovation of existing sites. I know maximum size is required. We do state a minimum of 2,000 square feet, but for any reason, if you have a project that is under that and you think would be applicable, um, just email us and we'll discuss. Sites is available anywhere in the world. And um, although not a, a requirement, we do encourage early engagement in the process because that's how sites was designed and that's how we can optimize the sustainability of your site. There are a total of 18 prerequisites and 48 optional credits, which add up to a total of 200 points. And here are the four certification levels, uh, 70 points to get certified all the way up to platinum for 135. Sites currently offers a flat rate <coughs> for projects as noted here, the fee is discounted for ASLA members and USGBC members at the silver level or higher. This is based upon the status of either the owner of, of the project or the project administrator for, that, for a given site's project. Uh, make sure the membership is current before submitting on sites online. Um, an additional discount is also offered in registration and certification fees if you pay those together at the time of project registration. And I know that pre-certification is noted here. I'm gonna mention that later on in more detail. So the site certification process involves um, a GBCI where documentation is required in order to achieve the certification. So we need to review that for uh, credit compliance. And there are no, currently no site visits from GBCI. In the next few slides, I will review the steps of using the common questions that we have received. So how do you register? You basically ent enter basic information into Sites online and you can get there from the site certification page or at that URL. Um, and then you will enter basic information like the project site area, the location, the name of the project, project owner, uh, the project administrator who will act as the manager overseeing the site's project um, and so on. And you can also go back in and change things if you need to. And this is also where you will be doing any payments um, as well. And then what happens after you register? After you register, GBCI will uh, email you and you'll be invited to a project-specific Dropbox folder where you can receive your site's worksheets and calculators. Uh, those are also available on sites online once you've um, gone through the registration process. And then after that, you implement sites on your project and you compile documentation per the requirements in the reference guide. So what if I have a question before a review? You can send questions to sites at gbci.org anytime during this process, even before you have a project re registered. If you have a question, you can email us. Um, for a registered project, you can, uh, you can uh, schedule a pre-review call if you are concerned about um, some credits. And then how do you submit for a review? You, you upload documentation to Dropbox and then you email sites letting us know that, we, that you are ready for your first review. And then after that, uh, we, were, we provide you a, re a review report, which um, identifies all the credits, how they're evaluated, and any feedback. We assess what's been um, anticipated as being achieved, what's pending, and so on. So you have uh, two rounds of review here. And then you, you can, after your review, you can also email sites with any questions, and you can also set up a post-review call as well. And then once you've been certified, we celebrate your achievement. So just to recap, a project can register at any time in the design and development process, but we strongly recommend that a project register at the earliest stages to gain access to the worksheets and work with GBCI more closely and to track progress accordingly. Certification, uh, there's two types of reviews and you can choose either one, they're the same uh, fee. Standard review means that you would submit all your prerequisites and credits being pursued. A split re review would mean that you'd submit part of your application at the end of the project design phase and the rest at the end of construction. And then the reviews take about uh, 20 to 25 business day days to get back a review report and some feedback. And in general, each credit re receives two rounds of review, the preliminary and the final. 
So for those familiar with sites, you know that sites was originally modeled after LEED, yet focused solely on elevating the value of landscapes and outdoor spaces. Some sites have the new buildings as part of their new construction, and many times that project wants to also seek LEED certification, which is great. Just as a reminder, the LEED rating system applies to your project building and the site it is located on, while the site rating system applies to everything on your site except your building with a few exceptions, like if you have a green wall or green roof as part of the project. If it, both the sites and lead rating systems are being considered, please let GBCI know as soon as you can so we can work to secure the same reviewer, which will be really helpful in streamlining that process. It's important to make sure also that the, that the lead and site project share a similar boundary for certification purposes. Uh, in addition, connecting the natural and built, natural and built environments and optimizing the relationship. Another reason to consider pursuing both certifications is because both, because projects that achieve sites goals automatically earn all the sustainable sites credits and leave before without doing any extra documentation. So there are important synergies among the two systems, which means that earning some lead credits automatically earn a sites credit or vice versa. And some are direct equivalences, as shown in the snapshot of the Synergies document. You can see the arrow going both ways. Um, it's important to also look at the details of the Synergies document uh, to make sure if there's any exceptions or considerations. Uh, th there's been a Synergies assessment done for LEED, BD, and C, and uh, LEED for Neighborhood Development as well. Both of these are available on our resources page of our website. And if you, during this process, if you have any questions about the lead credit or sites credit and these uh, synergies, or if you have a, uh, an alternative compliance, please just email sites at GBCI with that. I also want to briefly note that the various levels sites have been adopted into policy in the U.S. We hope to see similar policy action in other communities. If this is of interest for a future webinar topic, please be sure to let us know. The Sites Accredited Professional, or Sites AP, establishes a common framework to define the profession of sustainable site design and development. It provides professionals with the opportunity to demonstrate their knowledge, expertise, and commitment to the profession and the industry. And it's also something that we heard over the years that's really more applicable than the lead AP for some, some professionals. If you're interested in becoming a Sites AP, the first step is to register at a close prometric facility, but there's a catch here. Uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, Prometric is closed in some locations. Um, in the U.S. and Canada, it is closed until May 1st. Um, after that, there may be limited capacity, um, but I would just recommend that you check the website for updates, uh, the Prometric website for updates on that. If you do have an exam that's been already scheduled, you should have gotten an email notification. Um, you can reschedule that at, at no cost. The exam fee is $400 for members and $550 for non-members. The two main documents to use to study for the exam are the Sites V2 Reference Guide, of course, as well as the Sites AP Candidate Handbook, which is really, a, really explaining what the exam covers, what kind of topics, um, as well as gives you some sample questions and helps guide you through that process. So it's about a 13, 15 page document. And you can get, again, this, these documents on the site's website. Another really helpful tool for studying for the exam, getting more familiar with sites, is this four-week study plan that was developed. This is free to download. It's a syllabus that goes through day by day. Um, here it's outlined in four weeks, uh, but not everyone has the amount of time every day for that. But if you, so you can stretch this out to 12 or 18 weeks. But each day it provides some guidance on what to study, where the resources are, um, some some uh, test questions and, and so on. So it really helps navigate and organize the studying for the exam. I also want to point out we have a sustainable sites curriculum toolkit, which provides higher education faculty curated access to resources and processes organized to aid in teaching about and engaging students in the concept of sustainable land design and development and the sites rating system. The materials can be adapted and scaled to fit a variety of class topics degree programs and student learning levels. These materials don't provide a prescriptive path or set curriculum. Rather, we encourage you to select resources that are right for your courses. Um, so these can be applied as teaching materials, student assignments, or as supplemental resources to share with the class. So I encourage you to check that out if you're interested. 
So now I'm going to move on to some updates and highlights of the program. Here is a snapshot of the site's projects. You can see they really run the gamut in, in terms of project types from open space projects, government, mixed use, commercial, educational, streetscapes and plazas, institutional, botanic gardens, arboretums, and so on. We even in our other category, we have things like solar farms, cemeteries. Um, so we have about over 180 registered and certified projects representing approximately 248 million square feet. And this covers uh, 133 cities globally and uh, 37 US states in Washington, DC. So let's take a look at some of the most recent certified projects. Reopened in January 2019, the Avenue of Stars in the neighboring Salisbury Garden on the Hong Kong waterfront was designed by James Corner and local designers to fully capture the beauty of Victoria Harbor. Along the waterfront, more than 100 cele celebrity handprints and statues take you on a journey to the stars. This site, which plays host to tens of thousands of visitors each day, is the first site-certified project in Hong Kong and Greater China. During the renovation, the team focused on creating a greenery-filled, sustainable, and energy-efficient space for visitors to enjoy. Their design incorporated 700% more shade, 225% more seating than the previous design to keep visitors comfortable, with also low-grade pavers made of recycled glass to reduce glare from the nearby harbor on the sidewalk. And due in part to, this, to the green trellis, the project now has an 800, sorry, 830% increase in vegetation over the previous design, it's quite an increase. The plants chosen, all of which are low water consumption to reduce resource use, were selected by local gardeners to ensure that native plants were the star of the show. The Runway Park project achieved certified gold last year as well and became the first site certified project in mainland China. Located in Shanghai, China, this 28.6 acre project is a redevelopment of a former airport, as you can see on the top right, hence the name Runway Park. The, the project builds a valuable ecological patch in a highly urban area, which helps to improve the ecological quality of the city, as well as create a healthier, more interesting and meaningful living environment for local people. Approaches of the sponge city concept have also been applied in the design. The rain gardens along the roads reduce river pollution and flood impact by cleaning and, storm, cleaning and storing rainwater. This, is, this has really set a good example of state-of-art municipal stormwater management technology in Shanghai. And this is what we need to see more of in, in our urban areas. The Center for Sustainable Landscapes at the Phipps Conservatory is the first project to achieve Sites B2 Gold, sorry, Sites B2 Platinum in the world. This project is actually a recertification as it was also in the site's pilot program where it also achieved the highest certification level there. Previously, the 2.9 acre site was a, was a city of Pittsburgh Public Works Yard entirely paved over and portions classified as a brownfield. There were no existing land covers or ecosystem to, to preserve or protect. The Center for Sustainable Landscapes, a research and educational and administration facility now uses renewable energy produced on site, captures all storm water, and treats all sanitary water. Its design blurs the line between built and natural environments, plants clean wastewater for reuse, and every occupied space offers views of nature. The biodiverse plantings provide food, shelter, and nesting opportunities to endemic wildlife and also help link the site's landscape to neighboring 450-acre Shenley Park, Pittsburgh's second largest green space. Central to the Center for Sustainable Landscape, um, that landscape is a 4,000 square foot lagoon that you can see here that is fed by the conservatory roof runoff and populated with native fish and turtle. The project is considered one of the greenest projects in the world, having achieved sites lead well certification in addition to the Living Building Challenge. And here is the site's platinum project certified late last year. It's the first project to achieve site certification in the hospitality sector and in the state of Alabama. The lodge at Gulf State Park also, uh, it's a Hilton hotel, it's also pursuing lead, is a 350-room beachfront hotel located within Alabama's Gulf State Park. It's a really interesting collaboration between private and public sectors and between conservation and development. 
the project was motivated to use sites to measure the success of the dune restoration and the development of the landscape around the lodge as working green infrastructure. As you can, as you can imagine, a traditional hotel, hotel landscape mostly serves as decoration and requires a significant amount of water, energy, and chemical pesticides and fertilizers to maintain. In contrast, in contrast this lodge landscape provides habitat for wildlife, buffers the buildings from future storm surges, and naturally filters and absorbs stormwater through wetlands and swales. It's, it's clear these are all actions we have to take to address climate change, particularly in coastal areas. As we know, many, res many resorts and hotels are located on or near coastlines. You can see more of these certified projects on our website project directory and our, in our newsletters where we'll announce more of these in future community calls. This array of projects brings to light the ways the market is adopting techniques like green infrastructure through sites in order to enact a new vision for the future that sets a strong foundation for healthier, more equitable, and resilient places. Twenty twenty marks a milestone for sites. About fifteen years ago, leading practitioners, policymakers, and other sustainability experts convened to do something unusual move beyond the buildings to focus on outdoor spaces. This effort planted the seed for sites. Thank goodness for all those passionate, committed people. As mentioned earlier, the sites rating system is considered a living document intended to evolve as, as research and experience generate more knowledge. So your feedback and your application of sites on a project are valued and essential to sites evolution. In the next few slides, I'll briefly touch on some of the work underway and being planned for this year based on the feedback from sites users and our experience with project teams, clients, and others. In addition, going into this new, new, new decade, we must scale up the sites program even further. Natural climate solutions are necessary in our work ahead, and these are embedded in the sites approach. And as noted earlier, many of these sites-related solutions also provide a multitude of co-benefits like water filtration, pollination services, flood control, habitat protection, among many other ecosystem services. So one way we're doing this is to expand how we can use sites. This year we formally launched pre-certification and this was in response to feedback from the sites community for a formal recognition for projects in the planning phase. Site's pre-certification focuses on a project's plan, including its intended design and construction strategies. The project does not have to be built to be pre-certified. Pre-certification helps project teams determine which credits and prerequisites their project is likely to achieve during the full review much earlier in the process. The formal pre-certification recognition also helps to demonstrate commitment to site sustainability and resilience and helps market the unique and valuable features of a project to attract Community, supporter, community supporters, funders, and even influence permitting in some localities. Located in Butte, Montana, Silver Bow Creek Conservation Area has become the first site pre-certified project in the United States. As one of the country's largest Superfund sites, this project is embarking on an enormous and exciting transformation. This project, approximately 200 acres in site size, exemplifies what size is about, restoring function and vitality, regenerating life, not only ecologically, but within the local community by reconnecting people to nature through trails, interpretive and educational features, places for respite and social connection and other opportunities. In addition to Silver Bow Creek, there are other projects pre-certified in Asia, yet those have remained confidential at this time. The submission and review process takes a more streamlined approach than the normal process. In other ways, in other words, a lot less documentation. Uh, a pre-certified sites register project receives this site's pre-certification worksheet from GBCI to guide the process. You can see here is a little snapshot along the bottom um, will be every section of the rating system for the project team to respond to. This worksheet allows the project team to decide their compliance path for each required prerequisite and each credit that they will be pursuing. The team then describes their plans and intended strategies for meeting the requirements of those prerequisites and credits. And then after they submit the worksheet and scorecard and any other supporting documentation, the project will receive two rounds of review, similar to a normal certification process. And then um, if you've met all the prerequisites and enough credit points, the project can achieve sites pre-certification at pre-certified silver, gold, or platinum. 
And if the project continues to, chooses to continue on a full certification review path, the remaining fee is the certification fee only. And over the years, we've also heard much interest in applying sites, not only to new construction projects, but, all, but already built projects. We are currently investigating this and working closely with a couple projects. We are in the early stages, so if you have a project or client that might be interested in this, please email us at sites.gbci.org. We are also more actively working to better connect sites to lead and to leverage this relationship to promote sites. Stay tuned here for more details, but for now, please just refer to the synergies document I mentioned earlier on the resources page. Another exciting effort we have started work on this year is collaborating with a lead carbon subgroup, which is part of the sustainable site technical group to explore carbon metrics with a focus on rewarding projects for sequestering carbon on and off site. Carbon is currently addressed in multiple ways in the site's rating system through prerequisites and credits that promote and sometimes require conservation of healthy landscapes and the restoration of soils and vegetation on any degraded sites. Credits like optimizing biomass and the soil restoration credits support a system that can better sequester and store carbon. Other credits also target how we can reduce or eliminate emissions and fossil fuel consumption and instead of instead promote walking, biking, public transit, as well as promote the use of renewable energy, regional materials, energy efficient lighting, and electric maintenance, for example. With this carbon subgroup, we are reviewing tools like the Pathfinder app, the Climate Positive Design, iTree, and speaking with them, AutoCase is part of this. Sessions on this topic and work were also submitted to both ASLA and Greenbelt conferences. We do know that it was accepted at ASLA and we're um, still waiting on green bills. We're also excited about our uh, expanded outreach this year with our newsletters and these community calls. If you have not signed up for the newsletter, we will share a link in our follow-up uh, email after this webinar, or you can also go to the bottom of the site's website to sign up. The site's newsletter intends to promote leading projects and professionals and other news on sites and sustainable land development in general. Please feel free to share topics you would like to see in future webinars, share any articles of interest that relate to sites, or discuss with us about um, potentially authoring a new article on sites, which could, could potentially gain you some sites to use as well. To better connect with an international audience, we have done a preliminary assessment examining how sites interfaces with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and we plan to develop a document soon there to share. In addition, to, per, to provide better on-ramp tools for site certification and for the teams, particularly the documentation process, we are working on a guidance document to help project teams and clients better navigate the rating system and uh, understand the process of pursuing site certification, uh, which will, will supplement the reference guide. I'm going to now pass it over to Shauna, who will cover some important information about site CUs and related education. And following that, I will wrap up and briefly uh, mention the future webinar dates, and we'll have time for some Q&A. Um, thanks, Danielle. Can everyone hear me? Can you hear me, Danielle? <laughs> I can hear you. Thanks. Okay. Um, so, um, I'm Shauna, and I work in the TBCI credentialing department. I'm a credentialing specialist. I oversee um, credentialing maintenance program and any of the GBCI education courses. Um, today, I want to give you a specific overview on Sites AP and how you can help your Sites AP um, credential holders possibly submitting some courses. Um, so, all GBCI credentials. Are, uh, maintain their credentials in a two-year reporting period. Uh, two years minus one day, if you ever wonder why. Oh, it starts on August 17th, but ends on August 16th. So, but the purpose of credential maintenance is to encourage learning experiences that demonstrate continued competency and so you stay up to date in the industry knowledge. And that is the reason we um, have CMP. Um, and this is also the reason your reporting periods cannot be adjusted. Just to be um, a little bit more clear, Site AP um, credential holder is required to report 30 CE hours total. Six of those hours must be site specific, and the 24 
The other 24 hours can be a general CE hour. But you can report as many sites hours as you want. If you want all 30 of them sites, or if you want to do 15 sites, it's really up to you, but you need to have at least six rating system specific hours that your credential is. So general CE hour, um, they're defined as activities that are re relevant to the green building industry, um, deals with sustainability, human health, resiliency, and the circular economy. Um, so if you are doing something in LEED, that can go towards your general CE hour. Um, a site-specific hour is defined as an activity that is directly connected to your credit or prerequisite, uh, a site project, something like that. So it's directly connected to site. Um, go to the next one. So this is a little bit more explanation on what, so I'm doing a lead project, but I want to go, I want to use those hours towards uh, my site, AP also. So if you're doing something, a lead project, or if you're doing some lead exam maintenance, or even well, you can count all those hours as general CE hours. So if you're just taking a general CE hour course, you're taking a lead course, you're taking a well course, you can turn around and count those as your general CE hours. The only way you can get your site's hours is it has to be directly connected to the site. And there is a link here that um, shows you where you can find the CMP guys, but we are going to send it around to everybody after the call. So the, um, you can go, next slide. <laughs> so to report your CMP activities, there's four different kinds. There is education, there's project participation, authorship, and volunteering. So um, education courses, 90% of CMP holders do their um, CMP hour, I mean, credential holders do their CMP hours with education. And so that's why we're always wanting more site courses, which I'll discuss in a little bit. You can report as many education hours as you want. You can do all of your CE hours as education, or you can do six of your hours in, in education. Pro project participation is work on projects registered or certified for site. And again, you can have as, you can report as many hours as you want. It's an unlimited amount. Authorship is a site potential can report unlimited amount of authorship CE hours, but there's a catch here. You only get three hours for an article and 10 hours for a book. So say the book took you 150 hours. You unfortunately do not get to report 150 hours for your authorship. You can report, oh, I wrote this book, for 10 hours, I mean, I, I wrote this book, so I get 10 CE hours. Again, if you want it to be site specific, it has to be on technical content regard, um, related to the rating system. And the last is volunteering. And this is the only activity within the CMP that is, has a limited amount of hours. You can only count half of your CE hours towards volunteering, so you can only report 15 hours. For site specific, we we um, say if you're on a leadership position, a technical advisory group, a steering committee, again that directly is related to site. But you can also count volunteering as general CE hours if you're on an ASL, ASLA committee, your ASLA chapter committee, then you can count those as general CE hours. All right, um, so next slide. So now I'm gonna talk about um, the many site education courses. As I mentioned, 90% of the um, CMP, the credential holders report education hours as their um, CMP. The problem is we have had um, people wanting more site courses and we just, we just don't have them. So I'm hoping with my little small, um, small presentation here, I can entice someone to go, oh yeah, I think I can do a site course. 
I'll, I'll submit it. So um, anyway, next slide. <laughs> so the reading system specific criteria for a course used to be very, very stringent. It was, it was difficult to do a course that's rating system specific because in the learning objectives for the course, you had to have the rating system site, the version, version two, and a credit. And you had to have that in three out of the four learning objectives, or three fourths of the learning objectives. So if you had 10, that had to be in nine of the learning objectives. So this, this um, last year, we, we made it a little bit easier. And the reason we will encourage people to submit GBCI courses is because the only way a site AP can get a rating system specific credit in education is if it's a GBCI approved course. And that's very important. No one, can, they cannot count a rating system specific unless it has that GBCI number. Um, go ahead to the next slide. So our new criteria, um, which was changed in August of 2019, we decided to make it a little bit more simple and hopefully easier for people to want to go this direction. So three-fourths of the learning objectives need to be rating system specific by relevant topics. And what do I mean by relevant topics? I'll show you in the next slide, but let's continue on. And the in the course, it must again, it does need to specify the rating system site and the version, version two, at least once in the course title, the description, or the learning objective. It doesn't have to be in every one of the learning objectives. So you can either mention site version two in the course title, or you can mention it somewhere in the in the um, description or in a learning objective. Now remember though, three-fourths of your um, learning objectives must be related around a relevant topic, which we're gonna go into. But this way it's not, you're just not being, you know, smothered by, oh, I've gotta have a credit in there. You don't need to mention the credit if you don't want to, but you need to mention the rating system. Of course, um, whether it's a lead course, a well course, and site, if it's an older version, it will only be counted as um, general CER. So you need to stay with the current version. So say you're going to do synergies between site version two and version um, and B, D, and C 2009. Unfortunately, you would not be able to count the course as a lead course, but you still could do it for size. Um, so let's go to the next slide where I can talk a little bit more about the um, relevant topics. Here's a list of what we consider relevant topics, like site documentation. What, it, what do you have to do to register your site's project? Um, rating system development process. The synergies between credits. The synergy between a lead credit and the synergy between two sites credits. So those are the things that we're looking for when you develop your, um, your rating system specific learning objectives. So the next slide, I have um, a couple samples. The first one is just a site course. This would only count as a site course. Understand synergies between sites version two, credits and local regulations in your project. Relevant topic is credit. The criteria is met with that, and then of course the version and the rating system is in there. So the next one is summarize specific credit synergies between materials and resource prerequisite credits for sites version two and lead before B, B, and C, and how they can be applied to a project for the overall benefit of the end user. So this can be used for both site and lead. And that is just a very, very brief overview of what we are looking for in education courses. But it is important to know that we are looking for people to submit um, more courses. So I will be doing um, 
a webinar on how to submit, how to submit education courses. Um, the week of May 15th or 11th through the 15th. If you are interested, feel free to reach out to me and I will send you the date of the webinar. But there's a lot more to submitting a course, but that was the basic overview of a rating system course. That's all I have. Thanks, Shauna. Thanks, it was really helpful and I hope um, that helped some of the folks out there and um, hopefully we'll see some more education and you, you see some more opportunities for how to get your CEUs. Um, before we head to the Q&A session, to wrap up, I, I wanna emphasize that like LEAD sites is more than a rating system. It's, it's building on a global community of, um, sorry, I have a little, my computer was freezing for a second. It's building on a community, global community of committed professionals like yourself. It's implementing its global goals at a project level, using the rating system to translate these goals and facilitating the development of regional and local action too, like what has happened with the Atlanta Beltline. And likely pursuing site certification, certification and using the rating system also ensures that projects meet these high standards and keep everyone accountable. Sites, again, is more than a certification, it's an educational tool and a much needed voice at the table to ensure that this is incorporated to activate positive change and enact this new vision for our future. Reconnecting humans with nature will not only provide health and wellness benefits uh, that come from that connection and all the other essential benefits, but also encourages environmental stewardship in present and future generations. Thank you all for using and considering sites for your projects and your community so we can collectively foster community resilience and support regenerative systems. Here are the upcoming community calls, which will feature guest speakers, uh, less of us speaking and more of us, some of the guest speakers from team members of certified projects, subject matter experts, again, who help shape the credits, um, other sites advocates, you can sign up now for these on our events page if you're interested. Again, these are free and they'll, they'll be offering site CEUs. Um, but again, we want to provide you with the information you are looking for, so do share topics of interest via the chat box or um, after you close out of the webinar, you're gonna actually be prompted to with that same question as well. And in our follow-up email, email, we will provide some of this information in these links, so don't worry if you didn't capture all the details. Thank you again for your time today. Uh, anytime in the future um, you have a question, you can email sites at gbci.org. Um, and now we can have to take some time for some questions. Thanks, Danielle. Appreciate the presentation. We've had some questions come through the chat box and through Q&A as well. Um, we've um, answered a couple of small ones sort of individually if they're very specific. Um, but our first question that's come through um, is, um, Related to CE hours, the question is, is LEAD V4 project participation eligible for site-specific CE hours? So the only way uh, a LEAD project would go for site, I mean, site CE hours is it's also going for site registration. Okay, got it. Thanks, Shauna. Okay. <laughs> Appreciate that. That was very concise. <laughs> um, the next question that's come through, um, I think, is for Danielle. Does my project um, have to have a site AP on my team in order to pursue certification? Um, the short answer is no, although we do highly encourage teams to consist of at least one site AP to help with the process, but it's not required for eligibility or for getting certified. Um, we have provided innovation points for having at least one principal, principal participant of the project team um, uh, as a site's AP. So you do get some points as well for that person, but it is not required. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is a little more general. What should I consider to make sure that my project is eligible for sites? I'm not quite sure um, how you want to approach that one. Sure, and this is, um, in general, I had covered some of that, that we don't have a maximum size requirement. The minimum size, we state is 2,000 square feet, but we review that on a case-by-case -case basis if you have a project that's less than that. Um, if a project is more than two years old, we encourage that project to, in terms of two years past construction completion, uh, we do encourage that project to look at the requirements, the prerequisites to make sure they can, you know, prove compliance with documentation. 
Um, and it is available globally. And um, we do, we are more than happy to work with project teams outside the U.S. on a one-on-one -on -one basis if, if, if there's anything that is um, not covered, because we do have some U.S. references and standards um, that we can talk with you there. But in terms of the eligibility, the, the one place I direct people to also is to look at the, the prerequisites, the four prerequisites in the site context section, the section one of the rating system, because those will really deal with what's on your site before you do any design and construction. Do you have any critical sensitive features like healthy farmland or floodplains or wetlands, aquatic, other aquatic resources, um, any endangered or threatened species habitat, uh, something to look at more closely. We do have some um, exceptions and some ways to develop lightly, but um, it's important to look at those before you commit. And we're happy to set up a call to discuss with anybody. Thanks, Danielle. Um, so the questions that are coming through quickly now, so we're going to do our best to address all of them. Um, we just received a question specific to um, IN ASLA committees. I think that's Indiana. Um, the uh, person asking the question can correct me. Um, so you mentioned um, activity can go towards general CE hours. The question is what does and does not count towards that? So, and I, let me see if I, I'm getting this right. So, yes, being on an Indiana chapter main committee, um, for ASLA main committee, does count towards general CERs. What doesn't count, example, I have this example, is I'm going to redo my yard and I think I'm greening it. So I'm going to call that volunteer out. That does not count. That's not volunteering. You're you're wanting to do that on your own, you know, <laughs> sorry, your own yard. <laughs> but um, and I have had someone want to do that as their volunteer. <laughs> but um, any technical group, any um, committee that has to deal in the green building industry, whether it's ASLA or even if you're on a tag, a lead tag, you can count that towards your site. Um, CE hours. Remember, though, you can only count 15 hours. You can't go over that. That's it. Okay, thanks, Shauna. Um, sorry, I was on trying to undo my mute. <laughs> um, thanks, that's helpful. Um, the next question um, also regarding sites EP. Um, I think we, we might want to um, address this question in a little more detail offline with the questioner. It's, it's specific to the GSA program. Do we have recommendations on how sites AP professionals can connect or tap into the GSA program? Yeah, I think that we might have to do that offline. Um, seems a pretty detailed, but uh, yeah, let's, let's just do that offline. Oh, I, I want to give an update real quick. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Hot off the press, guys. Um, wow. Unfortunately, ProMetric test centers will be closed until the end of May, and then they will reassess if they're going to reopen them. So if you do have a site exam scheduled, reach out to ProMetric, or they can reach out to me, and I'll help. I'll help with it. But um, yes, I. Just been informed, ProMetric test centers are now closed until the end of May. Thank you. Things are changing so fast. I just looked yesterday, say May 1st. So, yeah, it's important to check the website. <laughs> <laughs> um, Danielle, we've had another question come through about um, recommendations for resources um, or tips on how we could speak to potential owners um, around the importance of landscaping. Um, if they may not understand the core principles of sites already. Sure, we have um, some resources on our website. There's a science, uh, site, sorry, sites client deck, which is a slide deck of um, various slides that lay out uh, case for sustainable land development uh, sites, uh, some of the sites practices, and because, you know, people can use, pick and choose the, slide, the slides that they want to use. They don't have to use the entire thing. Um, also, the ASLA um, Sustainable Design and Development Professional Practice Network has been working on a site 
in 10 updated presentations, some based on the client deck, some new information. And I believe they're pretty close. To, I know they showed it last year, last uh, ASLA conference um, with a, it's got a script. They're going to record it as well. Uh, so that's another tool to, uh, to use. It'll be posted on our resources page as well as um, ASLA's page. And we can have information about update on that as well. The, the great thing is to, I think, sign up for the newsletter where we'll be sharing all these updates when things are made available. Thanks, Danielle. Um, and we also included the um, main site, sustainable sites web, uh, web address in the chat box and folks can go there for central resources. The newest question to come in is, um, what is the standard time frame for review by site reviewers once the information is completely submitted? Sure, so each review takes 20 to 25 business days. And um, again, there's the two rounds of review. There's a preliminary and a final. So um, just add in 20 to 25 business days on the GBCI end to review for each of those reviews. Um, thanks, Danielle. I have a very specific question about plants. Are native plants required to pursue site certification? Sorry, I think you cut out for a second. Can you say it again? Sorry, are native plants required to pursue site certification? Um, no, that's not a prerequisite, so it's not, it doesn't fall under any prerequisite. It is a credit, so if a project does uh, use native plants as part of their design, uh, then they do get additional points. Um, at the basic prerequisite level, we just require that projects, when they're bringing in new plants, that they're using appropriate plants, plants for their climate and location, and they're not bringing any invasive plants to their project site, but they will get extra points if they use native plants um, in, two, in a few different places, but um, again, those are not required. Thanks. We're coming right up against the two o'clock hour. I'm gonna ask one more question, I think. Feel free to, um, to all of our attendees to submit your questions um, into our um, chat box function of the Q&A, and if we didn't get to them today, we certainly will try to address them, or as Danielle noted, um, email us directly. We'll be happy to respond there. Um, I think the last question I see in our Q&A is, um, how would I certify a master plan with phased construction? Yes, um, so that is a great question that we've received before. That, so the master plan itself can now get pre-certified as a whole. Um, that like we would see with the Silver Bow Creek Conservation Area in Montana that we looked at earlier. And then if there's a, um, if this is a large project and you have multiple phases of construction with unique timelines and construction schedules, uh, each phase can, can be um, separated out and get certified um, as, a, as a phase for each phase. And then if you have three or more phases, we offer a discounted approach. We also can, um, we strongly suggest a call with us to better, just for us to better understand the project and, and discuss how um, certain credits can span the entire project and not have to be, and can reduce some of the documentation. Great, thanks. Um, thanks, Danielle, I really appreciate that. Um, do you wanna uh, close up the webinar and we'll um, end the session and look forward to seeing as many folks um, on our next site community call? Sure, thank you, Anna Grace and, and Shauna and everyone for attending this uh, first sites community call of 2020. We're really excited to better connect with you and, and uh, be able to share knowledge from uh, sites users and sites experts and other sites advocates out there and have more dialogue in the future. So again, please share any webinar topics, um, any ideas for articles uh, to us, and we look forward to the next time. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your Earth Day.